think it is important for us to uh, uh, to connect with the scriptures when they are read. We don't always preach about all aspects of all of them, and the Hebrew text is not my main focus today, but as Jim read, those who are poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek you will give you praise. I was particularly drawn to the fact that the promise continually of the prophets is that those who are poor will eat and be satisfied. That the focus of our faith from the very beginnings has been on equanimity, has been on the fact that all who need to eat will eat, and that it is an aspect of the intention and purpose of humanity is not to get rich, but to make sure that those who are poor are able to eat. And that is the promise of the future when God's realm is truly happening. So let us keep that in mind uh, as, as, as we hear there. And then as this, this oh, uh, oh gladsome light, I, the, the phrase here, and this is part of connecting with what I'm talking about today, uh, in the words explaining this uh, ancient Christian hymn, the, the last sentence, when one sees Jesus Christ, one encounters the qualities of God. And that is what is happening in our gospel today, is what is being spoken about and what we try to talk about. Let us pray. Continue to bless us in this time, loving God. We are so thankful for this special music for these special men to be a part of our congregation, for everyone who has gathered together today in such a way that we are one in this moment. We are expressing from our many different parts the one body. We are living the life that is being called from us. We are thankful. Help us be grateful in the fact that we are receiving such wonderful gifts today from one another and from you. Continue to bless us as we are in this service together, anoint us by your spirit who is among us, and let it be that we join the psalmist of ages ago in understanding and praying that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth will be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Thinking about the Gospel of John passage that Jim just read, I think it is important for us to understand that biblical malpractice is often practiced when these metaphors are preached. Most of what I've ever heard about the, these metaphors or that particular metaphor about the vineyard is that uh, they're used to set up some sort of exclusionary realm. The formula goes like this. Jesus says he is something, and guess what? Most likely, you are not. So you better watch out, because God is going to get you, and you'll be sorry. That kind of talking about God is very bad theology. And we hear it all the time. Some today, some preacher somewhere who is following the new, the new revi the revised uh, lectionary is going to tell a congregation that unless they are good, the vineyard tending God is going to find them and cut them off from the good life, and worse yet, they might be thrown in the fire and burned. That is poppycock preaching. And let me say some more about that. <laughs> Let's try thinking about this in this metaphor in a new way. Just think about this vine being described as true vine because Jesus is undoubtedly cover and nurture for all. No one is excluded. Take away any negative, judgmental, shame and blame perspectives and the whole relationship becomes one of care and nurture. The true, the vine is true and good. In the natural order of things, not all branches live forever. In the natural course of relationships, not everyone gets on board. That is not cause for shame. 
It is simply time to do what needs to be done. Branches that produce grapes and wine are tended and harvested. Branches that are not giving grapes go for a different purpose. And that's the way it goes. In fact, without them, without those branches that don't produce, there would be no fuel for fires, for warmth and cooking. This is not about punishment. It is about differentiation and staying in relationships that are good and true and productive. The Gospel of John gives us these metaphors as a way of presenting Jesus as a connection to God. There are several metaphors in John that are called the I am statements by biblical scholars. The I am statements are a literary device that harken back to the identity of God. Many times in our Bible readings, we will hear the name Yahweh as the name of God. Yahweh is the name God called God's self in the story of the burning bush with Moses. The voice of God came uh, from the burning bush to Moses and told Moses to go and lead the Jewish people. Not being accustomed to coming across burning bushes, very much less talking burning bushes, <laughs> Moses was surprised by the talking bush and asked for its credentials. <laughs> Who do you say sent me? Who shall I say sent me to lead you? Was his response. Very justified. And the voice answered, I am who I am. Tell them, I am who I am is who sent you. And that is a phrase that is written in such a way in English to reflect the Hebrew as Y-H-W-H, which gets, uh, Ang which gets uh, uh, transliterated, which gets written in English as Yahweh, and that's what we have and is spoken in our translations. I realize that many of us already know this, but I wanted to remind us so that we could make the connection in John. That's because I think John is trying to explain who Jesus is to his audiences by connecting the identity of Jesus with the self-proclaimed identity of God. I think it would have been very familiar to ancient audiences to hear the gospel, who are hearing the Gospel of John to get the writer's point that Jesus was connected to the identity of God. I am. There are several other metaphors that many might remember in these statements of I am. Remember these, I am bread of life, I am light of the world, I am door of the gate or uh, the, the uh, door of the sheep or gate, I am the gate, I am good shepherd, I am resurrection and life, I am way, truth and life, and today I am true vine. Now there are two things I hope we remember about these phrases today. First, many preachers make these phrases exclusive by emphasizing the the in the English translations. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the true vine. Well, the thing about it is there is no the in the original writings. There's no exclusionary statement. It is a specific noun but it's not exclusionary. Each metaphor is not the only one. It is simply saying that it is, it is simply something. So my second suggestion for us to remember is that in most of these metaphors, it is something that is easily recognized and personally relevant. So try this experiment. You have homework besides the usual. <laughs> Think about something easily recognized, functionally important, and personally benevolent in your life. And maybe it's one of the essential elements of your day. And think about what Jesus would connect with to give us a clear pathway and understanding to God through that item. Complete the sentence, I am, with something that's in your life. It would be fun to get a group together to see what we would use in our day to have a parallel with, but we'll do that another time. 
Bread of life is sustenance. Light of the world is guidance. Door of the sheep or the gate is protection. Good shepherd is protector. Resurrection and life is eternal safety. Way, truth, and life is spirituality. True vine is connection, economics, food, drink, and growth. Today I'll stay with the classics. But go ahead and let your minds wander later on. See what you come up with and then compare those with the statements that are coming to us from 1900 years ago. And in order to combat the attacks of shame, blame, guilt, and victimhood that so many preachers go on and on about, keep your metaphors for faith practical, personal, and uplifting. The full intention of our faith is to connect persons with the eternal love and support of God. Our faith heritage and future mission is always and eternally about bringing goodness to life and making the world a better place. The reason John wrote this way is to give the early Christians something to connect with because they were living in very turbulent times. They may have been losing a grasp of who Jesus was and, they, and what he meant to them. John was written about 70 years after Jesus walked the earth and 30 years after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. It seems like the Gospel of John is trying to give people who are wondering what to believe a set of common and practical references to hold on to. And after you've done your homework, that can work well for us too. Today is a very special day in the life of our congregation. Welcoming our international visitors is a privilege and honor. They are skilled musicians and world travelers. They are church musicians who worship in a storied and ancient tradition. When we share Holy Communion, and I talk about our being connected globally, from now on we can remember the St. Petersburg Men's Ensemble as fellow travelers on our faithful journey. We share the Gospel of John as scripture. We share the love of God as our assurance. We have very different histories, but they took place on this same planet. We have a common savior, teacher, brother, and friend. We may think differently about aspects of our Christian faith, but our God is the same. In our differences and in our commonalities, we have the same invitation and purpose explained to us in today's gospel. Let's take that global and eternal connection with us today when we go from here. It is harder to hate and fear people who we know when good connections prevail. Jesus says in John's gospel today, if you live on in me and my words live on in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Abba will be glorified if you bear much fruit and thus prove to be my disciples. Someday when we have more time, we can talk about this further. For now, just remember that our good works in everyday ways are the fruit of God's vine meant for the good of all. And let's keep sharing that with one another and with the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.
Thank you.